Counselor and the poor wit. Hmm. A certain poor wit, being an hungered, did meet a well fed counselor. Marry, fool, quoth the counselor, whither away? In truth, said the poor wag, in that I've eaten naught these two days, I do whither away, and that right rapidly. The counselor laughed hugely and gave him a sausage. <laughs> the counselor was easier to please than my new master, the lieutenant. I would like to take post under that counselor. Oh, it is but melancholy mumming when poor heartbroken jilted Jack Point must needs turn to Hugh Ambrose for original life humor. Ah! <laughs> oh. Master Point. Ha! Friend, jailer. That was. Jailer that shalt be no more. Jailer that jailed not, or the jail jail he did, so unjailerly twas but Jerry jailing or jailing in joke. Though no joke to him, who by unjailer like jailing did so jeopardize his jailership. Come, take heart, smile, laugh, wink, twinkle, thou tormentor. That torment is not. Thou racker. That frack is none. Thou pincher. Out of place. Come, take heart and be merry as I am. <laughs> as I am. Ah, tis well for thee to laugh. Thou hast a good post and cause to be merry. Cause? Have we not all cause? Is the world not a big butt of humour into which all who will may drive a gimlet? See, I am a salad of it. And is there aught in nature more ridiculous? A poor dull, heartbroken man, who must needs be merry lest he be whipped, who must rejoice lest he starve, who must jest you, jive you, quip you, crank you, rack you, riddle you, from hour to hour, from day to day, from year to year, lest he dwindle, perish, starve, pine, and die. Why, when there's not else to laugh at, I laugh at myself. And yet, I have often thought a jest of calling would suit thee to a hair. Thee? Would suit thee? Thy death's head and crossbones? 
Aye. I have a pretty wit. A light, airy, joysome wit spiced with anecdotes of prison cells and torture chambers. Oh, a very delicate wit. And I've tried it on many a prisoner. And there have been some who have smiled. Now, it is not easy to make a prisoner smile, so it should not be difficult to be a good jester, seeing thou art one. Difficult? No, nothing easier. A ten, and I will prove to thee. <laughs> Private buffoon is a light-hearted loon if you listen to popular rumor. From the morn to the night, he's so joyous and bright, and he bubbles with wit and good humor. He's so great and so terse, both in prose and in verse, and though people forgive his transgression, there are one or two rules that all family fools must observe if they love their profession. There are one or two rules, half a dozen may be, that all family fools of whatever degree must observe if they love their profession. If you want to succeed as a jester, you'll need to consider each person's auricular. What is all that for B will quite scandalize C, for C is so very particular. And D may be dull, and E's very thick skull is as empty a brain as a ladle, while F is F sharp, and will cry with a carp that he's known your best joke from his cradle. When your humor they flout, you can't let yourself go, but it does put you out when a person says, oh, I have known that old joke from my cradle. If your master is surly from getting up early and tempers are short in the morning and an opportune joke is enough to provoke him to give you at once a month's warning then if you refrain he is at you again because he likes to get value for money he'll ask them there with an insolent stare if you know that you're paid to be funny it adds to the task of a merry man's place when your principal asks with a scowl on his face if you know that you're paid to be funny Comes a bishop, maybe, or a solemn DD, or beware of his anger provoking. Better not pull his hair or stick pins in his chair, he don't understand practical joking. If the jokes that you crack have an orthodox smack, you may get a bland smile from these sages. Or should they by chance be imported from France, half a crown is stopped out of your wages. As a general rule, though you'll see it may quench. If a family fool tells a joke that's too French, half a crown is stopped out of his wages. <laughs> Though your head it may rack with a bliss attack and your senses with tooth that you're losing. Don't be moody and flat, they can't find you for that if you're properly quaint and amusing. Though your wife ran away with a soldier today and took with her your trifle of money. Bless your heart, they don't mind. They're exceedingly kind. They don't blame you as long as you're funny. It's a comfort to feel that your partner should fit. Though you suffer a deal, they don't mind it a bit. And they don't blame you as long as you're funny. <laughs> So, that would be a jester, eh? Aye! Now listen, my sweetheart, Elsie Maynard, was married to this Fairfax fellow half an hour before he escaped. She did well! She did nothing of the kind, so hold thy peace and perpend. Now while he liveth, she is dead to me, and I to her. And so, my jibes and jokes notwithstanding, I am the saddest and sorriest dog in England. Thou art a very dull dog indeed. Now, if thou would swear that thou did shoot this Fairfax whilst he was trying to swim across the river, it needs but the discharge of an arquebus in a dark night, and that he sank and was seen no more, then I will make thee the very Archbishop of Jesters, and that in two days' time. Now, what sayest thou? I am to lie. Pardon, but thy lies to be a lie of circumstance, which I will support with the testimony of my own eyes, ears, and tongue. And thou wilt qualify me as a jester? As a jester among jesters. I will teach thee all of my original songs, my ingenious paradoxes, my self-constructed riddles. Nay, more, I will reveal to thee the very source from whence they came. Now, what sayest thou? Well, if it be but a lie thy wantest of me, I hold it cheap enough, and I say yes, it is a bargain! Hereupon, with 
above the green, all that we two do agree to will secure thy solemn need. To prevent all elemental, you are now see out to call with a story in the morning. How this pair fights dead and all, I declare to your dismantle. I to sweat, I declare to, I to sweat, I declare to, I to sweat, I declare to, I to sweat. To, I declare to, I to sweat to. Turn for my part, you're making undertaking to instruct you in the art. Art amazing, wonder raising, the majestic, just in free, proposition, high ambition, and a lively one I'll be. Wagga wagging, never flagging, wagga wagging, never flagging, wagga wagging, never flagging, wagga wagging, wagga wagging, wagga wagging. gone and no news of poor Fairfax, the dolt. I seek him everywhere, save within a dozen yards of his own dungeon. So I am free, free but for the cursed haste with which I rushed headlong into the bounds of matrimony with heaven knows whom. As far as I remember, she should have been young, but even had her face not been concealed by a handkerchief, I doubt whether in my then plight I'd have taken much note of her. Free. <laughs> The tower bonds were but a thread of silk compared to these conjugal fetters, which I, fool that I was, placed upon mine own hands from the one I broke readily enough. How break the other? <laughs> so tight a prisoner still a prisoner still ah is not one so tight a prisoner still in fetters held till his last hour chimes that no smith can weld no rust
well, Sergeant Merrill. How fares thy pretty charge, Elsie Maynard? Oh, well enough, sir. She's quite strong again. Leaves us tonight. Thanks to Dame Carruthers. Kind nursing, eh? I <laughs> deuce take the old witch. Twas a sorry trick you played me, sir, bringing a fainting girl to me. You gave the old lady an excuse for moving her quarters into my house. For two years, I've shunned her like the plague. Another day, Vicky, she'd have married me. <laughs> Good Lord, here she is again, Eileen Go. Nay, Sergeant Merrill, don't go. I have something of grave import to say to thee. It's coming. Dear faith, I think I'm not wanted here. No, Master Leonard, I have naught to say to thy father that his son may not hear. That's true, I'm one of the family, I've forgotten. Tis about this Elsie Maynard, a pretty girl, Master Leonard. Aye, fair as a peach blossom. What then? She has a liking for thee, if I mistake not. With all my heart, she's the daintiest little maid, as you'll find in a midsummer day's march. Then be warned in time, and give not my heart to her. Oh, I know what it is to give my heart to one who has none of it. Aye, she knows all about that. <laughs> and why should my boy take heed of her? She's a good girl, Dame Carruthers. Good enough, for aught I know. But she's no girl. She's a married woman. Married woman? So show lady she's promised to Jack Point, Lieutenant's new jester. Tush in thy teeth, old man. And my niece Kate sat by her bedside today. This Elsie slept. And as she slept, she moaned and groaned and turned this way and that way. And how can I marry one I have never seen? Quote she. Then a hundred crowns, quote. Then, is it certain he will die within the hour, quote she. Then, I love him not, and yet I am his wife, quote she. Is it not so, Kate? Aye, and tis even so. Art thou sure of all this? Aye, sir, for I wrote it all down on my tablets. Now, mark my words. It is of this Fairfax that she spake, and he is her husband, or I'll swallow my kirtle. Is this, uh, is this true, sir? True? Why, the girl was raving. Why should she marry a man who has but an hour to live? Marry? There be those who would marry but for a minute, rather than die old maids. Aye, I know one of them. <laughs> To be beheaded in a loud on tower green, tower, tower, tower green, gloom in dreary dungeon lying, gloom as good as dead or dying, for a pretty maiden sighing, pretty maid of seventeen. Seven, seven, seventeen. Strange adventure that we're trolling, modest maid and gallant crew. Gallant, gallant, gallant crew. While the funeral bell is tolling, tolling, Maiden will not tarry, though but sixteen years she carry. She must marry, she must marry, for the altar be a tomb, tower, 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 tomb, tower, tomb.
beauteous bride is none other than this winsome Elsie. By my hand, tis no such ill plunge in fortune's lucky bag. I might have fared worse with my eyes open. But she comes, now to test her principles. Tis not every husband who has a chance of wooing his own wife. Mistress Elsie. Master Leonard. So thou leavest us tonight? Yes, Master Leonard. I have been kindly attended. I almost fear I'm loath to go. And this Fairfax, was thou glad when he escaped? Why, truly, Master Leonard, it is a sad thing that a young and gallant gentleman should die in the very fullness of his life. So when thou didst faint in my arms, it was for joy at his safety. It, it may be so. I was highly wrought, Master Leonard, and I am but a girl, and so when I am highly wrought, I faint. Dost thou know I am consumed with a parlous jealousy? Thou? And of whom? Why, of this Fairfax, surely. Of Colonel Fairfax? Aye, shall I be frank with thee? Elsie, I love thee ardently, passionately. I have loved thee these two days, which is a long time, and I would fain join my life to thine. Oh, Master Leonard, thou art jesting. Jesting? May I shrivel into raisins if I jest? Elsie, I love thee with a love that is a frenzy, with a love that is a fever, with a love that eateth up my heart. What sayest thou? Thou wouldst not let my heart be eaten up. Oh, mercy, what have I to say? Dost thou love me, or hast thou been insensible these two days? I love all brave men. Nay, there is love in excess. I thank heaven there are many brave men in England. But if thou lovest them all, I withdraw my thanks. I love the bravest best. Sir, I may not listen. I am not free. I am a wife. Thou a wife? Whose? His name. His grave is dug, and his epitaph set up. Come, his name. Sir, keep my secret. It is the only barrier that fate could set between us. My husband is none other than Colonel Fairfax. The greatest villain unhung. The most ill-favoured, ill-mannered, ill-natured, ill-omened, ill-tempered dog in Christendom. It is very like, for I never saw him. I was blindfolded, and he was to have died within the hour. But he did not die, and I have wedded to him, and my heart is broken. He was to have died, and he did not die. The scoundrel, the perjured, traitorous villain. Thou should have insisted on his dying first to make sure. Tis the only way with these Fairfaxes. Oh, bloodthirsty little maiden. Ah, oh, speak for this Fairfax. Be mine. He will never know. He dares not show himself. And if he dare, what art thou to him? Fly with me, Elsie. We will be married tomorrow, and thou will be the happiest wife in England. Master Leonard, I am amazed. Is it thus the brave soldiers speak to poor girls? For shame, for shame. I am wed, sir. Not the less because I love not my husband. I am a wife, sir, and I am a duty. Oh, sir, my words terrify me. They are not honest. They are wicked words, and they sound of thy great and brave heart. Oh, shame upon me. Shame upon me. Nay, Elsie, I did but jest. I spake but to try thee. <laughs> Why, an archivus, fire from the wharf, unless I much mistake. Ranger at such an hour, what can it mean? Now, what can that have been? A shot so late at night, in a Like a 
should vigil keeping or expect to fall upon. I beheld a figure creeping. I should rather call it crawling. He was creeping. He was crawling. He was creeping, creeping, crawling. He was creeping. He was crawling. He was creeping, creeping, crawling. Not a moment's hesitation. I myself upon him flung with a hurried exclamation to his draperies I clung. And we clawed with one another in a rough and tumble smother. Colonel Fairfax and no other was the man to whom I clung. Colonel Fairfax and no other. Colonel Fairfax and no other. Colonel Fairfax and no other was the man to whom he clung. After mighty tag and tassel, he began to fall and struggle. He bites into stronger muscle, or by some infernal juggle. From my crutches quickly sliding, I should rather call it slipping. With a view, no doubt, of hiding, or escaping to the shipping. With a gasp and with a quiver, I described it with a shiver. Down he dived into the river, and alas, he could swim. Though he loved to make a shiver, with a gasp and with a quiver. Down he dived into the river, it was very grim. Ingenuity is catching, with a view, my quiver pleasing. I could bust myself to snatching. I should rather call it seizing. Answer to a bled, I dispatch it through the head. With an answer to a bled, he dispatch it through the head. I discharge it without winking, little time I lost in thinking, like a stone I saw him sinking. I should say a lump of lead. He discharge it without winking, little time he lost in thinking, like a stone I saw him sinking. I should say a lump of lead. Like a stone, my boy, I said. Like a heavy lump of lead. Like a stone, my boy, I said. Like a heavy lump of lead. Anyhow, the man is dead, whether stone or lump of lead. Anyhow, the man is dead, whether stone or lump of lead. And thou didst see all this? Aye, with both eyes at once. Aye, aye. The testimony of one eye is naught, he may lie. But when it is corroborated with the other, then that is good evidence that none may gainsay. Here are both present in court, ready to swear to them. But art thou sure it was Colonel Fairfax? Saw you his face? Aye, and a plaguy ill-favoured face too. A hangdog face, a felon face, a face to frighten the headsman himself and make him strike a rhyme. <laughs> oh, a plaguy bad face, take my word for it. <laughs> How they laugh. An accepted wit has but to say, oh, pass the moutard, and they roll their ribs out. If I ever come to life again, thou shalt pay for this, Master Pun. Now, Elsie, thou art free to speak again, so behold, me. I am young and well favoured. I have a terrific wit. I could get you, Jack, and quickly drag you back to the man. Oh, no, it's not how to woo. Tis not to be done with time worn jest and threadbare sophistries, with quips, conundrums, rhymes, and paradoxes. Tis an art in itself and must be studied gravely and conscientiously. <laughs> Jack in the study, the man, if he wants to make sure of his skill, if he wants to make sure of his skill, if he wants to make sure of his skill, if he wants to make sure of his skill, if he wants to make sure of his skill, if he wants to make sure of his skill, if he wants to make sure of his skill
Mistress Elsie, there is one here who, as thou knowest, loves thee right well. That he does right well. He is but a man of poor estate, but he has a loving, honest heart, and he would be a true and trusty husband to thee. And if thou shalt be his wife, I will lie curled up in his heart like a little squirrel in its nest. But it is a pretty figure. A maggot in a nut lies closer. <laughs> but a squirrel will do. He knoweth that thou wast a wife. An unloved and unloving wife, and his poor heart was near to breaking. But now that thy unloving husband is dead, and thou art free, he would fain pray that thou wouldst hearken unto him, and give him hope that thou wouldst one day be his. He pushes a hand, and he whispers in her ear, Old Pemmicans, what does it mean? Now, sweetheart, tell me, wilt thou be this poor good fellow's wife? Is he a brave man? Is he a brave man? So men say. That's not true, but we'll let it pass. <laughs> if the brave man will be content with a poor, penniless, untaught maid. Widow, but let that pass. Then I will be his true and loving wife, and that will be my archivite. My own dear love. Why, what's all this? Brother! Brother! It is not seemly. I can't let that pass. <coughs> Master <coughs> Leonard, an advocate should have his fee, but. Methinks thou art overpaying thyself. Hey, that is for Elsie to say. I promised thee I would show thee how to woo. And herein lies the proof of the virtue of my teaching. <laughs> Go thou and apply it elsewhere. <laughs> Thank you. 
for jealousy. <laughs> the lieutenant's cook made now, but the meanest gossip. Jealous of me? <laughs> I'm jealous of no craven cock on a head who crows about what he do and what he did. I'm jealous of another and better man than thou who set that down, Master Wilfred. <laughs> and he used to marry Elsie Maynard. The man thou lovest is to marry Elsie Maynard? Why, that's none other than thy brother, Leonard Merrill. Mercy, did I say it? Why, what manner of brother is this, thou lying little jade? Speak, who is this man thou hast called brother, and fondled, and coddled, and kissed, and with my connivance too? Oh, Lord, with my connivance too? Could it be this Fairfax? It is! It's not a curse of Fairfax! Fairfax! Oh, now I just shot through the head of who lies at the bottom of the river! I may be mistaken. <laughs> we are the fallible mortals, the best of us. But I'll make sure. I'll make sure. Stay. One word. I think it cannot be Fairfax. Mind, I say, I think. Be because thou hast a slain Fairfax. Whether it be Fairfax or no Fairfax, he is to marry Elsie. And, and, as thou hast just shot him through the head and he is dead, be content with that. And I will be thy wife. 
Is that sure? Aye, sure enough. For there's no help for it. Thou art a very brute. But even brutes must marry, I suppose. More beloved. <laughs> Phoebe, rejoice, for I bring glad tidings. The Colonel's reprieve was signed two days since, but was foully and maliciously held back by Secretary Poulterwhistle, who designed that it should arrive after his death. It has just come to hand and is even now in the lieutenant's possession. Then the is free! Yes. Oh, kiss me, my dear! Kiss me again and again! <laughs> 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 and let me know the worst. This is the real Leonard Dot. The other has fucked his substitute. The real Leonard, I say, my father's own son. How do I know that? Has your brother writ large on his brow? I mistrust thy brothers. Thou art but a false jade. Now be just, Wilfred. Truly, I did deceive thee before, but it was to save a precious life. And to save it not for me, but for another. They are to be wed this very day. Is not this enough for thee? Come, I am thy Phoebe, thy very own, and we will be wed in a year, or two, or three at the most. Is not this enough for thee? <laughs> Phoebe, hast thou heard the brave news? Aye, father. And I mud with joy. Uh, uh, what's all this? Oh, father. He discovered our secret through my folly, and the price of his silence is my... Phoebe's heart. Oh, dear, no. Phoebe's hand. It's the same thing. Is it? Oh, oh, oh I'll help me, son. Father, oh, no. oh, It is a pity that the Colonel had to be saved at any cost, and as thy folly revealed our secret, <laughs> thy folly must e'en suffer for it. So? Dame Carruthers. This is a plot to shield the arch fiend, and I have detected it. One word from me, and three heads will roll from their shoulders. Uh, nay, the Colonel Fairfax has been reprieved. Yet if my complicity in the escape were known, oh, plague on the old meddler, oh, there's nothing for it. <clears throat> the hush, the pretty one. Such bloodthirsty words ill become those. Cherry lips. <laughs> Sergeant Merrill. Why, look ye, Chuck. <laughs> for many a month I've thought to myself, the snug love saving up in that middle-aged bosom for someone. So why not for thee, that's me. So tell her, that's thee, that's thou, that's me. Love us her and... Well, I'm a miserable old man, and I've done it, and that's me. But not a word about Fairfax. The price of thy silence is... Meryl's heart! Meryl's hand. It's the same thing. Is it? <laughs> Doleful, doleful, when humanity with its soulful of satanity caught in privity down the clivity sees captivity. Doleful, doleful, caught in privity down the clivity sees captivity. Doleful, doleful, joyful, when virginity seeks on joyful man and divinity sees on darling white and barley boy is a darling joyful, joyful, sees on darling white and barley boy is a darling joyful, joyful. Last 
the ghastly when man sorrowful, thirsty, lastly of tomorrow, for after Harry, yields for Harry, goes and Harry, ghastly, ghastly, joyful, joyful, ghastly, ghastly, joyful, joyful, ghastly, 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 ghastly,
the heart of massive rock, unmoved by sentimental shock. Oh. 